proposed to focus uh, on it. Section 29.2D of the Scotland Act in effect states that a provision of an act of this parliament which is incompatible with convention rights or with EU law is not law. The purpose of that provision is to ensure that acts of this parliament do not breach the United Kingdom's obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights or under EU law. So far as EU law is concerned, the same constraint applies as long as we are members of the EU to all public bodies within the UK, including the United Kingdom Parliament. The question which has to be asked is accordingly whether any provision in this bill is incompatible with EU law. Presiding officer, the legislative competence of the provisions in the bill fall to be, falls to be considered in light of these facts. First, that the United Kingdom government has taken steps under Article 50 of the Treaty of European Union to withdraw the United Kingdom from the European Union, and that by virtue of the terms of Article 50, in the absence of agreement otherwise, the UK will leave the U European Union next March. Second, that EU law will thereupon cease to apply, and on the basis of the Supreme Court's analysis in the Miller case, the EU law constraints on the powers of this Parliament and on Scottish ministers will cease to have any content. And third, that there is an urgent practical necessity to make provision of the sort contained in this bill to enable the law to operate effectively immediately upon and after the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the EU. Against that background, let me make these observations about the provisions of the bill. The legal obligation on ministers to comply with EU law will endure until the UK leaves the EU. This bill does not change that obligation. Ministers will continue to be subject to legal requirements to transpose, implement and otherwise abide by EU law so long as the UK remains a member of the EU. This bill does not alter those requirements. The bill does nothing which will alter European Union law or which undermines the scheme of EU law while the United Kingdom remains a member of the EU. What the bill does is to make provision for the continuity of the law immediately upon and following withdrawal from the EU. It does this by two principal mechanisms. First, it provides for laws in force before the UK leaves the European Union to continue in force in domestic law after departure. To make such a provision is plainly not incompatible with European Union law. And secondly, the bill confers powers which will enable the law to be adjusted as required so that the law will continue to work effectively immediately upon withdrawal from the European Union. The terms of the bill ensure that its provisions will not come into effect and those powers cannot be exercised so as to alter or affect the law before the United Kingdom leaves the European Union if to do that would be incompatible with EU law. So the grant of those powers and their exercise in accordance with the bill is not and cannot be incompatible with European Union law. In short, the bill is designed to achieve two things. First, to enable the continuing effectiveness of the law upon and following the UK's departure from the European Union. In other words, to secure a smooth transition in a manner which is consistent with the European Union law principle of legal certainty in the context of a withdrawal process which is itself provided for by European Union law. And second, to make sure that this is done in a way which does not involve any breach of European Union law, which does not put the United Kingdom in breach of its obligations under EU law for as long as the United Kingdom remains a member of the Union. It is not incompatible with EU law to make provision to deal with the inevitable consequences in domestic law of withdrawal from the EU in this way. Indeed, that appears to be the basis upon which the United Kingdom government's own EU withdrawal bill, upon which this, this bill has been modelled, proceeds. If that is right, and if contrary to the view of the Scottish government, this bill 
is incompatible with EU law, then the same reasoning would apply equally to the UK government's bill. Presiding officer, in your assessment of legislative competence, you put your finger on the central point which arises in relation to this bill, that it contains provisions and empowers ministers to make provision by regulations, which if they were to come into force before the UK leaves the EU, would be incompatible with EU law. And you characterize this as involving an exercise of competence before the competence has been transferred. But the Scottish Government's view is that this bill is framed to ensure that any provisions which would have that effect can only come into force when the UK leaves the EU. As the presiding officer of the National Assembly for Wales has concluded in the context of the Welsh Government's bill, that makes all the difference and ensures that there is and can be no incompatibility between the provisions of this bill and EU law. The bill has been carefully drafted so that it is not incompatible with EU law. Nothing can be done under it which would put the United Kingdom in breach of its obligations under EU law. This is not a case where the Parliament is being asked to exercise a competence before that competence has been transferred to it. Rather, this Parliament has competence at this time to deal in the way that this bill provides with the consequences for our domestic law of leaving the European Union. But finally, presiding officer, let me say this. Uh, I appreciate that members uh, have an interest in the legislative competence of this bill, and I look forward to answering to the extent that I properly can questions which members uh, across the chamber uh, may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now move to questions. Adam Tompkins. Sir, and I thank the Lord Advocate for his statement and for early sight of it. I have two quite detailed legal questions to ask him, if I may. First, in his answer yesterday to Bruce Crawford's parliamentary question, the Lord Advocate stated that the constraint in Section 29 2D of the Scotland Act that this Parliament may not legislate incompatibly with EU law will, when the United Kingdom withdraws from the European Union, cease to have any content, his words, cease to have any content. The policy memorandum accompanying the bill says that it will empty of meaning. Could I ask the Lord Advocate to clarify why he thinks this and indeed what he means by it? Because it strikes me with great respect as really rather odd in that it implies, does it not, that we as a public body can be constrained by EU law only for as long as the United Kingdom is a member state of the European Union. Yet that isn't the case, is it? The Westminster Parliament, when creating this one, could have legislated to prevent us from enacting law contrary to EU law, irrespective of whether the UK was or was not a member state of the European Union. Now, the policy memorandum refers to paragraph 130 of the Miller case in the context of this matter, but that paragraph does not support the conclusion that after Brexit, section 29 2D will cease to have any content. That's my first question. Second question concerns the difference between legal effect and legal validity. It is true, as the Lord Advocate said, that the bill is carefully drafted to ensure that provisions that would be contrary to EU law will not come into force until after exit day. But this consideration goes, does it not, to their legal effect in the future, not to their legal validity now. And the question of competence, when it comes to compatibility with EU law, is a matter of legal validity, not future or anticipated legal effect. Yep. This is the point, the critical point of legal analysis on which the presiding officer relies. I think it's correct why does the Lord Advocate not agree? Lord Advocate. Uh, thank you, and I'm, I'm grateful to Professor Tompkins for those questions. Um, on the first point, um, the effect of withdrawal from the EU, um, uh, the uh, analysis which I uh, uh, take of the position, which the Scottish Government takes of the position, uh, reflects the analysis of the Supreme Court in the Miller case as I understand it. Um, uh, the uh, analysis of the Supreme Court in its application to the definition of EU law 
for the purposes of the 1972 Act uh, uh, was that um, uh, uh, withdrawal from the EU would empty, empty that uh, of content. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, on the Scottish Government's analysis, that flows through to an effect uh, on the uh, definition of EU law within the uh, Scotland Act. Uh, and uh, paragraph 130 of the Supreme Court in the Miller case uh, uh, said this, the removal of the EU constraints on withdrawal from the EU treaties will alter the competence of the devolved institutions unless legislative constraints are introduced. In the absence of such new restraints, withdrawal from the EU will enhance the devolved uh, competence. Um, so uh, while recognizing that um, respectable legal minds may sometimes disagree, um, I uh, respectfully um, adhere to the uh, approach which has been taken in the analysis of, of this bill. O on the second point, the distinction between uh, which Professor Tompkins has made between uh, validity and uh, e effect, um, Section 29.2D of the Scotland Act is concerned with compatibility with EU law. And um, the purpose of that provision is to ensure that this Parliament uh, doesn't act in a manner when passing legislation which would put the United Kingdom in breach of its international obligations under European Union law. This bill has been carefully framed so that nothing under it or done under it can or will put the United Kingdom in breach of those obligations. And for these reasons, uh, 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 I would suggest uh, that um, uh, uh, there is nothing in this bill which is incompatible uh, with EU law. Neil Finlay. Uh, can I thank the Lord Advocate for his statement? As I stated yesterday, Scottish Labour will always defend the principles of devolution in the settlement in Scotland and we support the Scottish and Welsh Government in their effort to make the UK Government fulfil the commitments they gave on the devolution of powers. And we would urge the UK and Scottish governments to get back round the table to resolve Clause 11 issues because we want to see a workable and competent bill presented and we'll work with others for a solution to this situation. Um, we note the statement from the presiding officer and we note the Lord Advocate's statement also. It's a regrettable situation we find ourselves in, but given the government is now seeking support to circumvent normal conventions of this parliament, it's incumbent upon all members of this parliament to ensure that there is thorough scrutiny uh, of this legislation. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I therefore ask the Lord Advocate, uh, what are the difference between, differences between the bill being presented to the Assembly in Wales and the bill being presented here? Has the Lord Advocate consulted his counterparts in Wales about how they managed to bring forward a competent bill and why this hasn't been replicated here? Uh, can you advise what precedent is set here if a bill is introduced and passed without the presiding officer's approval? Uh, on what legal basis uh, has this, is this being done through emergency legislation and what is the longest period that parliamentary scrutiny can take place without affecting implementation? Has any previous bill across the UK been given royal assent when it has not been deemed as competent by the respective parliament? And given the government's previous defeat on Brexit issues in the Supreme Court, how confident is he of defending the case? Finally, President Officer, this bill has the potential to impact on a huge number of organisations, citizens, communities the length and breadth of the country, and they must be allowed and be able to have their say. It's our job in this chamber to ensure that happens. This bill throws up many questions and challenges for the government, for parliament, and from members of this parliament. Does the Lord Advocate agree that rushed le legislation is rarely good legislation and that ex extensive scrutiny in such a complex area is a good thing? A number of questions for the Lord Advocate. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, the first point to make clear is that the Scottish Government is satisfied that this is a bill which is within the legislative competence of this parliament. Um, the uh, I am not, although the Welsh constitutional settlement is, a, is different from the uh, 
uh, settlement in Scotland, uh, and there are differences in the approach of the two bills. Uh, I'm not aware of any relevant difference bearing on the critical issue on which the two presiding officers have uh, uh, disagreed with one another. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that, uh, as, as the presiding officer, I think, recognized in his statement yesterday, um, uh, a negative certificate from the presiding officer does not prevent this parliament debating and, if so advised, uh, passing a, a bill. Um, ultimately, the only authoritative view uh, on the questions of law which arise in the context of legislative competence uh, is uh, a view from the court. Uh, and on the question of the um, nature and extent of parliamentary scrutiny, well, that, that's a matter uh, for the parliamentary authorities uh, to consider uh, and not one that I think it would be appropriate for me to uh, comment on. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Lord Advocate for his statement. We are in extraordinary circumstances which neither this Parliament nor the people we represent have chosen to face, but we do face these extraordinary circumstances. Where there are alternative interpretations of a complex area of law like this, would it be reasonable to suggest that one of the factors that we need to bear in mind is the intention uh, of Parliament, the Westminster Parliament in this case, when they passed that legislation. And so when we look at Section 292D of the Scotland Act, defining legislative competence in relation to EU law, would it be reasonable to suggest that no reasonable person could imagine that Parliament, the Westminster Parliament's intention would be to constrain us in relation to EU law in circumstances where we were outside of the European Union. Secondly, can I ask, if this Parliament chooses to debate amendments which change the continuity bill during its scrutiny, perhaps to address some of the shortcomings that some of us perceive uh, in the, the EU withdrawal bill itself upon which this is modelled, will the Lord Advocate or the Scottish Government have a continuing role in determining the competence of an amended bill. Lord Adam. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, on the first point, um, the purpose of Section 29.2D is to ensure that this Parliament doesn't put the United Kingdom in breach of its EU obligations. Um, it follows that when, this, when the United Kingdom is no longer a member of the EU and when um, EU law no longer applies to it, that Section 29 2D uh, ceases to impose constraints on this Parliament. Um, on the second point, um, uh, the question of amendment of the bill, um, the statutory position is that at the end of a bill process, when a bill has been passed by this Parliament, uh, law officers uh, have the opportunity to consider whether the bill uh, uh, by virtue of any amendment has gone out with competence and may on that ground refer it to the Supreme Court. That's the statutory answer. Uh, the practical answer uh, is that uh, if amendments are brought forward which in the view of the government um, uh, uh, informed by uh, the views of law officers uh, is out with competence then that's something that will be uh, communicated uh, as appropriate in the course of the parliamentary proceedings. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Lord Advocate too for uh, his statement this afternoon. Can I ask the Lord Advocate to consider the third possible route described in the Bill's uh, policy memorandum on page 5? There, the Scottish Parliament passes the Bill. The UK Government then does what the Scottish Government expects and deletes the devolved aspects from their Bill. Would the Lord Advocate then accept that the only continuity legislation is the Scottish Act? What then happens if the Supreme Court strikes down that legislation as out with competence? Lord Advocate. I've spent a lot of time in my professional career avoiding hypothetical questions. <laughs> um, I, 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 the only question that um, needs to be addressed at this point is, uh, uh, from my perspective, is whether or not this bill is within the legislative competence of the Parliament. Um, I, I, I think it would be unwise for me to speculate about what might happen uh, in, in an uncertain future. <laughs>
Stuart, Stuart McMillan to be followed by Donald Cameron. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Lord Advocate confirm that this bill is in effect designed to dovetail with the EU withdrawal bill at Westminster on the expectation that the UK Government will remove the devolved aspects from the withdrawal bill in the event this Parliament does not pass a legislative consent motion? Lord Advocate. It, the, it's the view of the Scottish Government that if um, this Parliament is unable to consent to the EU withdrawal bill, that the constitutionally correct position would be for the United Kingdom Government to remove devolved matters from that bill and for this Parliament to pass uh, its own provision to deal with legal continuity. Um, the uh, skilled parliamentary draftsmen who draft Scottish Government legislation ha have worked hard to seek to align uh, this bill uh, so far as uh, possible consistent with certain policy differences uh, with the uh, provisions of the United Kingdom Government's bill. Donald Cameron to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you. Uh, the Lord Advocate has already touched on this in his statement, but does he then disagree with the statement of the presiding officer that, and I quote, the consistent approach to interpreting the powers of the Parliament has been that legislation cannot seek to exercise competence prior to that competence being transferred? Lord Advocate. I think the, I think the important thing to... Um, consider is the particular provision of, the, of Section 29 with which we are dealing. Um, under other parts of Section 29, questions of whether a bill relates to a reserve matter, whether a bill um, uh, uh, modifies um, uh, or in, in, infringes Schedule 4 of the Act, um, uh, questions could arise of, of that sort. Um, it, again, it wouldn't be wise or appropriate for me to express uh, a, a, a definitive view on a hypothetical question, um, but it's important, in, it, it, I would suggest, uh, it's important, I would suggest, uh, not to read across uh, an approach which may be taken in relation to other parts of Section 29 uh, to the particular issue here, which is, whether or not provisions in this bill are incompatible, incompatible with EU law. Emma Harper to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. Could the Lord Advocate confirm that this bill is simply about preparing Scotland's laws for what will happen after the UK leaves the EU and that the bill has been drafted so that right up until that time the Scottish Parliament will continue to act at all times in a way that is compatible with EU law? Lord Advocate. Uh, no. <laughs> the, short answer, the short answer, presiding officer, is, is yes. But perhaps I can make, <laughs> I, but perhaps I can make two, two further points. First of all, the negative point: th this bill uh, is drafted to make sure that nothing will be done which is incompatible with EU law before uh, uh, withdrawal from the EU. But positively, this bill provides a practical mechanism for securing the EU law principle of legal certainty in the context of a process which is specifically provided for by EU law, the process of withdrawal upon which we are engaged. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Lord Advocate for his statement. It is highly regrettable we are in the situation that we have conflicting views from the Lord Advocate and the Office of the Presiding Officer, and the Parliament needs to be confident in the competence of the legislation we are considering. The Lord Advocate has argued that the bill is legally competent and he said there has been significant effort to align the bill with the EU withdrawal bill. Um, can he comment on the route of combining the bill further with the EU withdrawal bill and is he confident that this could secure a smooth transition as identified as a key objective of the bill in his statement? Lord Advocate. Its preferred position would be a single piece of United Kingdom legislation to which this Parliament can consent. Uh, and that remains the position. But we're not at this point, uh, 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 that, that's not the point that we are uh, at. Um, and that's the context in which this, this bill is brought forward. Um, as I said in answer a moment ago, this bill has been drafted by skilled parliamentary draftsmen 
in order, so far as uh, uh, reasonably possible, to align with uh, the approach taken in the uh, United Kingdom's Kingdom government EU withdrawal bill. Um, uh, again, I, it would be wrong for me to speculate on uh, the way in which um, either bill might develop as they continue through their parliamentary process. Ash Denham to be followed by Morris Golden. As far as he is aware, does the Lord Advocate think that the bill prepared by the Welsh Government is attempting to achieve the same aims as the Scottish Government's bill? Lord Advocate. Well, again, the short answer is yes. Um, as far as I'm aware, the, the purpose is the, is, is the same. Um, there are differences which reflect um, di differences in the particular um, situations of the two uh, constitutional settlements. Morris Golden to be followed by Claire Hockey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Lord Advocate focuses on compatibility with EU law within his statement. As he knows, that's the, not the only constraint um, on this Parliament's competence. Uh, can the Lord Advocate explain why, in his view, no provision of this bill trespasses on matters otherwise reserved to the UK Parliament? Lord Advocate. Yes. Well, uh, I, I sought to focus in my statement on what, what um, I regard, and I think the presiding officer regard, as, as the fundamental issue. I think members may take it that the Scottish Government is satisfied that um, the, uh, this bill doesn't um, go uh, out with the legislative competence of this Parliament in any other respect. Claire Hockey to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you, President Officer. Contrary to some suggestions elsewhere, can the Lord Advocate confirm that the Scottish Government, through this bill, does not attempt to use powers reserved to the Westminster Parliament? Lord Advocate. The question was Sorry. from Claire Hockey that it doesn't take reserved powers from elsewhere. Yes, and no, there's nothing in this bill that um, affects any of the limits on the competence of this Parliament um, other than the l limit on competence imposed by uh, EU law. Question number 10, James Kelly followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you. Bearing in mind the seriousness of this situation and that we have different legal advice from the presiding officer and from yourself, uh, Lord Advocate, uh, can you state whether you took any additional external legal advice separate from that of your in-house legal team? Lord Advocate. Uh, as members of the Parliament w will be well aware, the Scottish Government does not disclose the source of uh, its legal advice. Um, th there is one express exception in the Ministerial Code, which is that um, Government may uh, state what's a matter of uh, public record, that law officers will uh, clear any certificate of competence of a bill. That's the basis upon which I have uh, uh, confirmed that I cleared uh, the certificate of competence for uh, this bill. And I, I am here today as a member of the Scottish Government and, like any other minister, um, explaining to the Parliament the Scottish Government's position uh, in relation to its legal analysis of, of, of this particular bill. Ben McPherson to be followed by Alec Neil. Thank you, President Officer. Lord Advocate, you made a number of references and comparisons to the UK Government EU withdrawal bill. For clarity, is it not the case that any argument suggesting that the Scottish Government is acting in a way that is incompatible with EU law could also be used to argue that the UK Government's legislation is incompatible with EU law and therefore is one, if one is compatible with EU law, the other is as well? Again, I think the short answer is, is yes. Alec Neil. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I welcome the Lord Advocate's uh, statement? Can I ask uh, the Lord Advocate if he can confirm the, that the Supreme Court decision in relation to the Gina Miller case in Article 50, where the Supreme Court dismissed Sewell as a convention and not law, can the Lord Advocate confirm that that would nevertheless make this bill justiciable and likely to succeed as valid if it ever ends up in the Supreme Court? Lord Advocate. The, the question... Well, 
Indeed. I mean, the question of whether any bill of this Parliament is or is not within legislative competence can ultimately be adjudicated upon uh, by the courts. Uh, again, I'm not uh, uh, going to anticipate the hypothetical uh, possibility that this bill may end up in uh, any particular forum. Can I thank the Lord Advocate and members for... Oh, point of order, Neil Findlay. President Officer, um, I, I was asking the Lord Advocate on what legal basis this had to be done through emerging, emergency legislation, but he, he didn't address that in his answer. I wonder if you could address that. Uh, I wonder if you, President Officer, could address that point as to why the proposed bill would have to be done through emergency legislation. I thank Mr Findlay. I noted the question, he asked a number of questions of the Lord Advocate, including questions such as that which were probably more designed for the Parliament, the Parliamentary Authorities, or the Minister for Parliamentary Business. The question of whether or not a bill uh, needs to be emergency legislation is one for this whole Parliament. The Parliamentary Bureau will discuss this, will take a, a viewer or, or make a, a recommendation. Maybe not make a recommendation, but will bring the issue to the Parliament. It will then be for the Parliament itself to debate and decide whether it wishes to see this treated as emergency legislation. So in the end, Mr Finlay, it is up to you and all the members in this, in this chamber. Thank you. On that point, we conclude the ministerial statement. We move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 10650 in the name of Michelle Ballantyne. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.